to do is, and I think people who are really interested in labor relations understand this, is that labor relations and, la and labor law is a very interdisciplinary discipline. And um, one of the things that I think is really special about labor law is it's the study of people. And as the study of people, it, people are artists and musicians. So we often have, when we go to conferences like uh, Class Matters or the Law and Society or things like that, mostly about like Class Matters, um, we have labor artists and labor musicians and theater people, and they're all part of what we think is our community of people. So I thought it would be a great idea to have that, something like that. And I also thought being that this is West Virginia, which is one of the greatest states in the union and a great state for to teach and study labor law, I think, and to have a West Virginia st storyteller. And um, so um, after talking to Tony, Michael, and Sarah Stevenson, I learned about um, Karen, and I, I've seen Karen perform. And um, this is Karen Baranch, and this is her friend, Vincent oh my God. Barsetta, Barsetta. <laughs> another good Sicilian man. And um, they're going to they're going to do a play that Karen has written. It's a one act play with four scenes. And she's, it starts in 1910 when she's a little girl. And in each of the scenes, she's going to grow up before your eyes to being a grandma by the 1980s. And it's about, it's called Coal Mine, Coal Mine Memories. Coal Camp. Coal Camp Memories. And she's going to tell the story of West Virginia coal miners and coal, around like coal camps. I haven't seen this, so I'm very excited. And so I'm going to turn the stage over to our guests. Please help me welcome our storytellers. to my little, oh, that's my favorite song to sing. My best friend Missy and I sing it all the time, but she's not here right now. I'm just waiting for my pa's shift to come off the coal mine. Every day when that mine whistle blows, us young'uns run as fast as we can down the tipple. See our daddies. See what treat he has for us in his lunch bucket. Maybe it's a piece of sandwich. Or maybe a piece of fried pie like Mom makes for us up the house. Oh, I know it's the same food that Mom makes for us, but it always tastes special when it comes from down underground in a coal mine. When them coal miners come up from underground, I don't recognize my pa straight away. Them miners are covered from head to toe with an old, gritty, black coal dust. Some of the miners go straight away to the company bathhouse to take them a bath. But my pa, he don't like to spend the extra money on a company bath. He goes on home where ma has a big old number three tub of water heating up for his bath. First thing he does when he comes in the house, all tired and dirty from working all day, he takes them old, dirty hands and he blackens our noses with them. <laughs> then he takes a nap. My pa is so tired from working all day, he's going to lay down and sleep before he can bathe or eat. Of course, he gets up soon. When he sleeps down, he can't sleep on any of the clean sheets my ma's been working all day. He's got to lay right down in the middle of our kitchen floor. But he gets up soon enough, and Ma washes his back down real good. No matter what, there's big old black rings of circles of coal on Daddy's eyes. <laughs> Can't never get away from, with the coal. Then we sit down to eat. There's plenty of good food to eat at our house, especially near the first of the half. See, coal miners, they get paid twice a month. So each payday is a half a month. 
So on the first of the half, sometimes my pa gets a steak. Of course, on those days, us young'uns, we eat beans and cornbread. Or when we get salmon, we each get one teaspoon, and Pa gets the rest of the can. I think salmon is the best food in the whole wide world, but we would not think about complaining because Pa works so hard on the ground. But sometimes I only see my Pa on Sunday. He's up and off to work of a morning before I'm awake, and he don't come home till I'm asleep at night. Some nights I'm lying in my bed, and a noise will wake me up. And I hear Pa getting ready to go to work, tromping down those carnation milk cans so his feet won't slide down in the snow. He can't afford a new pair of boots this year. I hear Ma rolling out biscuits for his breakfast, and I smell coffee brewing. But I don't have to get up, because it's about 2 o'clock in the morning when Pa's going off to work an 18-hour shift. I could just snuggle back to sleep with my two sisters in this big old metal bed of ours. Only other thing that's going to wake us up is when the train goes by this here coal camp house. Train tracks run so close behind the house that when the train goes by, the whole house rattles and shakes. Got to hold on to the bed, otherwise you fall out of a night. Of course, sure as the sun coming up, I got to get up and go to school. Well, first, I do my chores. My chore is to haul water to this here coal camp house. No such thing as running water and only one pump for all of J Row. So you walk down the row of houses, each one looks exactly alike, and you haul back whatever water Ma's going to use of a day. Taint too bad of a chore though, because everybody sends their young'uns for water of a morning, so it's a nice place to say good morning to your friends. After we do our chores and we eat our breakfast, then we head off to school. It's about a two-mile walk up the holler. No such thing as buses or nothing like that. Got to walk there and back. No matter how cold it is, we walk to school. Now, in the real cold weather, my big brother Ben, he goes on out ahead of us to get the coal stove heated up. See, all of us youngins from this here coal camp of Kayford, we sit in one great big room. Not as big as this one, or not as high as ceilings, but a pretty big room. And the coal stove, it's right in the middle of the room. So if you're sitting down in the front or, or in the back and you ain't near the coal stove, it can get mighty cold to sitting in your seat. But Ben, he goes early to take the chill off of the room for our teacher, Miss Covey. Oh, I like school, and I like Miss Covey. Every day, she starts school the same way, with the Pledge of Allegiance, the Lord's Prayer, and then she inspects our hands and our face and our neck and our ears and makes sure they're clean. She makes sure all the boys has a clean handkerchief. But that Miss Covey, well, she has got to have the skill of a chess player. She juggles all the grades and all the subjects all by herself. And no matter what, she has special time for each and every one of us. I don't suppose any of us would dare disobey Miss Covey, because if we did, she'd take a switch to us as quick as we could say our ABCs. And if we went home and complained to our parents about getting switched at school, get switched once again, make sure you learned your lesson real good. Not the sweet cut, cut, switching so bad, you got to go out and cut your own switch. Cut four or five, make sure you get one that hurts real good. <laughs> but I don't have to worry about getting switched at school because I'm kindly a pet of Miss Covey's. She lets me help her with the reading and the writing and the arithmetic for the younger ones. But still, my favorite this time of all is when all of us girls go sit under the great big old oak tree and trade out lunch buckets. I like it best of all when I get that new Italian girl, Maria's lunch bucket, sort of like my friend Ann here. She's as Italian as she can be. Her mama makes food I ain't never eaten before. It's pepperoni and bread all rolled up together. Well, I hear tell some coal miner up in Fairmont, West Virginia, invented them pepperoni rolls so he could take his lunch underground all the easier. Next time you eat you a pepperoni roll, you got a West Virginia coal miner to thank for it. <laughs> Sometimes I go home with Maria to help her with her chores or she'll help me with mine. And when I'm at her house, 
Her mama has a great big old batch of polenta a cooking on the stove. It, my, she uses cornmeal the way my mama does, but it don't taste and look the same. My mama says, it's a waste of good cornmeal making that mush. I hate to tell her, I kind of like it. <laughs> I like school, and I like Maria, and I like my teacher. Tell you what I don't like about school. It's that mean, hateful old Jimmy Kent. See, my name is Hallie Marie Jones. And if you go in alphabetical order, Jimmy Kent is always sitting right behind me. And he is always up to some meanness or another. He pulls my braids. He throws spitballs at me. Once, he even dunked my braid in the inkwell. I got back at him, though. I tricked Jimmy Kent into eating a green persimmon. <laughs> have you ever eaten a green persimmon? There are too much of city folks have done that. Woo-wee, make your mouth pucker up. You think you won't whistle again for 100 years? <laughs> it was worth the inkwell. After school's out, we hurry on home to do whatever chores Ma has lined out for us, like hoeing in the garden or something like that. If Ma ain't to home, all I do is look around the front porch as a J-row, and wherever her broom is a-leaning up against, that house She's gone there to give that woman a hand. Or we might find five or six women in our kitchen. You know, one has an egg, one has a cup of sugar, one has a cup of flour. They get together and make a cake. we got fine neighbors. And everybody has a lot of children, so there's lots of children to play with. Well, some families have as many as 12 or 14 children. Lots of places to play. Right outside the mountains, uh, coal camps is the prettiest mountainside you ever did see. Well, one place that we like to play is a gob heap, a slag pile, it's a slate dump. It's the place they dump all the coal, has too much rock in it, and they can't sell it on the market, so they just dump it in a great big old pile, but it is not a very safe place to play because part of it is always on fire. I asked my Paul once, why does it burn that away? And he called it spontaneous combustion. I still didn't know what that meant. So he told me it just started into burning without anybody ever lighting it. Well, that one gob heap, it has been a burning for nigh on to two years now. It has a real bad smell. My mama says it smells like sulfur. I think it smells like rotten eggs. Can't get away from rotten egg smell in the coal camp. I guess after a while, you sort of get used to it. <gasps> There's the coal mine whistle. I got to run now. I got to go meet my pa. now. Time to put away baby games. Oh, I'm still in school. I go to Leewood Junior High School down Cabin Creek Holler, and this year I'm going to graduate from the eighth grade. See, I am only in the eighth grade because I had to set out of school for a couple of years. Well, my mama got sick, and seeing as how I'm the oldest girl in the family, it's up to me to stop going to school and start taking care of the house and do all the cooking and all the cleaning and such as that. But this year, this year I'm going to graduate from the eighth grade. Next year, some of the students in my class, they'll be taking the train on down Cabin Creek Holler to East Bank High School. My English teacher, Miss Lively, once desperate bad for me to go with them, said that I could be a teacher one day if I worked at it. 
I don't believe I can go, though. You see, school is free, but the train costs money. I don't have the money to go to high school. Instead, I'll get me a job working for Ms. Lambert down the clubhouse, waiting tables on the single miners or them that don't have their families here at Kayford. I wish I could go to school, but I, I, I have got to take on my responsibilities. I've got to help my mama with the younger ones. I've been doing that for as long as I can remember. As long as I can remember, there's been a little one tugging them my skirts, hollering after me, Hallie Marie, wait for me. And if I didn't wait for them, or if I hid from them like I used to do sometime, oh, lost my ma would get after me. Wasn't my ma be Ms. Morgan, Ms. Dobbs, Ms. Lawson? Living in a coal camp is like having a whole camp full of mothers. Everybody looks after everybody else's youngins. Now, I have got to hurry right home from school today because today is wash day. My mother and I wash all of our family's clothes by hand with nothing but a big old number three tub of water and a washboard. We use that old, gritty, lye soap to wash our clothes. And when we're done washing clothes, our hands are raw and red, cracked right open. Got to rub lard into your hands. Get the feeling back in your hands. I do not like washing clothes much. When we're done washing clothes, we put the clothes out on the clothesline. No matter how cold it is, we put the clothes in the clothesline. In the dead of winter, they are frozen stiff as a board. <laughs> got to warm them by the fire before we can put them on. Now, we've got to be careful about the train coming through k Ford and our clean clothes hanging on the clothesline. I don't know if that makes sense to all of you. What does trains and clothes have to do with each other? But the train comes twice today. And when it comes, it is spewing forth soot and cinders. And if it come into K-Ford with our clean clothes on the clothesline, then clean clothes would get plumb full of soot and cinders. And we would have to wash them all over again with that old horrible soap. So we hear the train coming, we get the clothes off the line and get them in right quick. I don't suppose it matters, train or not. When them clothes come off the clothesline, they are plumb full of a fine, gritty, gray coal dust. Can't get away from coal dust in a coal camp. We eat it, we breathe it, and we wear it. Ma's going to let me take care of the chickens one day soon. Well, chickens is not a job for the ch a child to do. What well, with 10 children in our family, plus my mother and father, that is 12 miles to feed. Every egg those chicken lays is precious. You wouldn't want a little and now going into the chicken coop, feeding the chickens, and stirring up a fuss so the chickens wouldn't lay just right, or God forbid, breaking an egg. No, that is a job for the mother of the family to do. But Ma says that I might have chickens of my own one day soon, so I need to learn how to take care of the chickens. But my most favorite chore to do for Ma is to go to the company store. While the company store sells everything in the whole wide world, they sell shoes and boots and hats and coats and canned goods and bolts of fabric, and you can buy you an automobile if you have enough script wages. But and there's always old timers sitting around the, the pot bellied stove playing checkers or telling ghost stories. Oh, now, when I have my pa's script card, I don't stop nowhere. I just go straight to Mr. Taylor's window and hand him the card. The card is printed with boxes indicating the days that pa has worked. And we can draw some script wages towards the next half. I like to die of embarrassment. When Mr. Taylor says real loud for the whole store to hear, now, Hallie Marie, you know you Joneses can't have $5 worth of scrip. You can only have two fifty. I wish the floor would open up and swallow me whole. Oh, there's never any extra for candy for the youngins or them red ribbons I'm looking at for my hair. That only comes at Christmas time. But Christmas time's a wonderful time in a coal camp. The company buys every youngin an orange and a piece of candy. And Pa and Ma save back their script wages and get us each one present we're looking at. I hope my Christmas presents this year are those red ribbons I'm looking at for my hair. Folks have been telling me that stores outside the coal camp don't charge as much money as the company store. 
I asked my pa, why don't we just shop there instead? He said life could be real difficult for a coal miner whose family didn't shop at the company store. He said there could be an accident underground. It wasn't really an accident. Just the company's way of warning a man he better start spending his money at the company store. Don't make no difference, I expect. Coal miners get paid in scrip. It's coins with holes in the middle or, or little pieces of paper. It's good for the company store, the company movie theater, the company doctor. But it ain't no good outside the coal camp unless you sell it for less than it's worth. Still, some of them fellas, they sneak out under cover of darkness and go over there to old man Hatcher's store and sneak in that secret door he has in the back. And they sell their script for half of face value and still get more goods for their money. Well, that means the company store has raised prices on Mr. Hatcher four times. It's all too confusing for me. But my most favorite time of all is when somebody has a play party at their house. We all go over one person's house, take out every stick of furniture. Some of them start playing the, the banjo and the fiddle like my friend Vince over here. And the rest of us start into dancing. Laws, we have a good time. Lately, I have been dancing a lot with Jimmy Kent. <laughs> well, he's as handsome as he could be. Went to work last year with his daddy underground, and sometimes of an evening he comes calling. Oh, my mama was not very happy when Jimmy Kent first come to call. See, last Halloween, a year ago Halloween, he got himself into a peck of trouble. Pierce, he and a couple of other boys decided to go out on Halloween night and raise a ruckus. Well, what they decided to do was to go down Amro, pushing over every outhouse behind the coal camp houses. What they didn't know is Mr. Siznowski was in his. When they pushed that outhouse down, door side down, Mr. Siznowski was stuck for two hours. And he recognized Jimmy's voice. Oh, Jimmy had a lot of work to do, setting up each one of them outhouses, putting a fresh coat of whitewash paint on each and every one of them. Now, we knew there were two other boys involved in that prank, but he would not give up their names. And do you know what happened? Every single boy in Kayford helped him do his chore so he wouldn't have to say who it was helped him out. My mama said she didn't care. She said the boy who would do such a thing was not welcome to come a-calling on her daughter, and that would have been final. I would not have been able to see Jimmy Kent again. If my two brothers hadn't confessed... <laughs> and said they had more to do with it than they'd first let on. And they suggested that Mama give Jimmy Kent a second chance. All my Mama said was, well, turn my head around and bite my neck. <laughs> I, I declare, I'm glad she did give Jimmy Kent a second chance. I think that Jimmy Kent is the finest man to wear shoe leather. We go out walking of an evening. Sometimes he holds my hand. I am always home by 10 o'clock sharp. And wouldn't you know it, right when I am coming up to my front porch and Jimmy's going to say something real tender-like to me, every one of my neighbors finds something to be doing on their front porch with their lights on, as if I'm the kind of girl that you need to keep an eye on. Is that Jimmy? He's a fine feller. And to think he's the same boy used to tease me so when we was youngins together. Oh, he still teases me. Ask me when I'm going to put my hair in the braids because he's got the ink well ready. I tell him, go straight ahead. I got a green persimmon sandwich just waiting for him. We laugh and then we dance. Want to give us a tune, Vince? <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, there it is. Used to dance when I was young. Ain't got time for that now. Jimmy and I got married a while back. We have three youngins now. John David for both of our fathers and Elizabeth Ann for both of our mothers. And Jimmy, well, he's just a baby. Lance, I never knew how much there was to do with raising a family in a coal camp. What with having kids and raising kids and cleaning this ever-present coal dust like I'm always seeming to be doing, managing the finances. Oh, Jimmy works as many as 18 hours a day underground when coal is in boom. He ain't got time to worry how them script wages are spent. I got to do all of that myself. And there never seems to be enough to go around with all the checkoffs from his script card. Before we ever see them script wages, company takes out what we owe them first. Well, let's see, there's rent on this here coal camp house. We pay $1.50 a month per drop cord light. You got four lights, four rooms in a square, a Jenny Lynn style house. That's four lights. That's $6 a month rent. That may not sound like much to all of you, but when you only get $10 a month, $6 takes a mighty big chunk out of that $10. Well, let's see, there's whatever we owe at the company store. Some folks get themselves script bound. They have to turn over their entire paycheck to the company and set off the next half in debt all over again. And there's doctor bills and union dues and house coal. Oh, yes, we pay for house coal. Here we are living and dying so the rest of the world can have coal, and we got to pay for house coal. I think if I could take all the coal I have swept out of this house, the camp and the chunks, we'd have enough coal to heat us the rest of our lives. And I wouldn't have to send my boy John David over to the gob heap, sneaking out lumps of coal when the foreman ain't looking, or running alongside a railroad car trying to catch a lump of coal as it falls. Well, that ain't safe. Last week, a boy from over on M Row got his face gashed right open. Even my youngins have to work hard. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean to complain. It's a hard life, but that's a fact. But it's a good life. I got wonderful children, best neighbors in all the world, and my Jimmy's a good man. Oh, I'm lucky he's not like some of them fellas, taking a drinking and a gambling and a carrying on on a Saturday night. Not that you all in Morgantown need to know anything about that. <clears throat> <laughs> they don't burn couches back in my day. I just could tell you that. <laughs> But there's a lot of fillers that do go out. My husband, he done my next door neighbor, Donald. He goes out every single Saturday night, a drinking and a gambling and a carrying on. And if he's gambling and he's winning money, he don't even know how much money he's got in his pocket. He just keeps shoving his money into his pocket, you see. Now, his wife, she knows this. So she waits for him to come home and fall asleep, and she goes into his pocket and gets herself out for a rainy day. Then she's got to figure out where to hide it, so... She figures the Bible is a pretty safe place. <laughs> of course, the time comes when he starts a ranting and a raving. Where does the money go? Where does the money go? And she says, Donald, if you just open the Bible, you'll find all the answers to your questions. <laughs> he don't never look in the Bible, but she feels a whole lot better. She told him the truth. <laughs> I declare. Everybody in K Ford knows the money's in the Bible except Donald. Oh, they don't bother it none. We don't even bother to lock our doors of a night. What would be the use? We all got the same thing. Nothing. No reason to lock your doors against nothing. And Donald works every bit as hard as every other feller does underground, Jimmy says. They wouldn't tolerate a slacker in a coal mine. He just says, Hallie, some of them boys have to go out on a Saturday night in order to face going underground Monday morning. I expect it's true. Lord knows those boys work hard. Well, we work hard, too. Every woman that keeps a family together in a coal camp has to work hard. Let's see, every Monday I do my washing, and every Tuesday I do my ironing. Got to do it that way. Company turns off the electricity during the daylight hours except for Sunday because they say the tipple needs to pull too much electricity. But about a year ago, company store got them newfangled washing machines and ironing machines. And to make sure we all went out and bought us one, they left the electricity on Mondays and Tuesdays so we could buy us a washing machine and ironing machine. So rest of the week, we don't have electricity. So we do chores that don't need it, like 
hoeing in the garden or putting up canned goods for contract time or springtime. Now, every day, I go out looking for wild greens in the forest. I got me a fine garden. I do like my mama done. I go up in the, in the, uh, the holler a piece and cut me out a piece of new ground. Get away from the noise and the smell of a coal camp, she used to say. But I, if I go looking for wild greens, it makes the greens in my garden go all that much further. And it's a sociable way to spend an hour with your women friends at the end of the day. And we've been taking us with the women from Yugoslavia with us. I think that's how you say it. Oh, we got folk from all over the world in these coal camps. They come here from Italy and Poland and Hungary. Russia and Syria and Lebanon. We got blacks come up from the south in Alabama where they're mining coal. They come here because the conditions are better than down there, I can tell you that. And when they come here, they ain't got any time to get them a garden started. So they get straight away to work. And, we, um, and we've been showing the women where the wild greens grow in the garden. So we got um, ramps and creasy greens and such as that. Jimmy's right proud of it, of my garden, though. He says, Hallie, best plant you an extra row of corn this year. We may be going out on strike. Well, he's been telling me in them cities where them folk live, like Detroit and Pittsburgh, they don't have room for a garden because they're all jammed in together. And when they go out on strike, they have to go back to work before they want to because they don't have any food. These West Virginia boys can about live off their wives' gardens. I kind of like that. All the fussing and fighting. And carrying on, these fellers do about their unions. What comes down to win the day is something as peaceable as a woman's garden. Oh, don't get me wrong. Women have been involved in the union movement as far back as their men have been. Well, I weren't but 10 years old during the 1912 and 13 Cabin Creek, Paint Creek strike. We were evicted from our house and lived in a tent in a town called Holly Grove for two years. Now, now, this is a real pretty day. Skies are blue and just a little bit of a wind. But you think about what's coming here next month or two, the, the winter we're going to have. They're predicting a bad winter this year. You think about the rains of April and the heat of July. And you think about living in a tent for two years with ten children, half of them still in diapers. And every night into Holly Grove come a train. We called it the Bull Moose Special because it was armed with gunmen, thugs, Baldwin Feltz detectives, they was called, nothing more than a hired army for the company. These men had no morals, had no, no, no uh, ethics at all. They, didn't, they, they were murderers and arsonists and such as that, and they'd ride that train into Holly Grove and they'd shoot into the tents, not caring if they killed women or children. Every night, my mama would lay us down to sleep, and she would line the tent with pots and pans and skillets as a barrier against the mine guard bullets. It was the women done tore them railroad tracks up, so the Bull Moose Special couldn't get back into Cabin Creek. It was the women. Now, the time my daddy asked me if I'd go get a bucket of milk from some coal miners down the railroad track, now, he told me, he told me that there'd be some of them Baldwin Feltz boys between his, between his group of coal miners and that. And he told me, let them bald and felts look inside that bucket of milk, both a coming and a going. I was scared to totally to death. Them big old men bearing down on me like they done, threatening me like they done. When I come back, I handed that bucket of milk over to my daddy. He took it from me, and he poured out the milk. And there in the bottom of the bucket... It was filled with bullets. When my mama found out he had sent me for the ammunition, she was furious. He said, Ellie, it had to be that way. If she knew what she was a carrying, she might have given herself away, but there was no other way for us to get the ammunition. We all helped with the union movement. Now, the time a woman come through here named Mother Jones, she was sent by the United Mine Workers of America, but she was an older woman, kindly plump and had white hair. Well, she looked just like your granny. <laughs> but she didn't talk like your granny. Oh, no, she swore like a sailor. <laughs> you all, I think they've heard her talk. I weren't allowed to go hear her because she swore too, many, too much, I can tell you. One time, she gathered up 100 men 
and marched down to the capital of West Virginia, the one that's standing there today, and declared war on the state of West Virginia. But another time, it weren't the men folks she was looking for. Well, she had heard the scabs were going to go to work over in Whitesville on the other side of Kayford Mountain. She gathered up every woman she could find. My mama was one of them. And in the middle of the night, they marched up over that mountain. And the next morning, when them scabs come to work, there was a hundred women standing there, armed with nothing more than pots and pans and brooms. But didn't nobody go to work that day. I guess our brooms are as important as our gardens. <laughs> I didn't always like working in the garden. I recollect one time before I was married, my mama asked me and my two brothers, Ben and Bill, to go plant some corn up new ground. Well, you know, my brothers, they wanted to play baseball. You know how all fired important baseball is to these boys here in the hollers? Unless you're a Cubs fan, then you're just plain disgusted. I knew they'd get that one. They're city folk. <laughs> well, I didn't want to plant corn either. I had plans to go with my girlfriend to the swimming hole. So my brothers were such rascals, they talked me into taking a handful of corn and hiding it under old holler log down the end of new ground. Said when the corn wouldn't come up, we would just tell Pa it had gone bad. Now, if you're not city folk, maybe you're farmers, you know what's going to happen next. That old holler log was covered up with co corn plumb clear through to the sky. And Pa knowed right away what we'd done. I guess it made it easier to pick being all in one place like that. <laughs> and we were looking for chores we could do standing up for quite some time. We didn't know. We didn't know the difference that that handful of corn would make. That it would be the difference between going hungry for a week or having a week's worth of corn pone or cornbread or polenta, depending on where you're from. My pa and ma wouldn't talk about it. But some nights when the young'uns are asleep and we have one more cup of coffee to drink, we'll sit down at the kitchen table. And Jimmy will tell me what it's like underground. He says it is pure blackness underground. You can't even see your hand in front of your face if it wasn't for the carbide light on your soft hat helmet. It's damp and wet underground. Some days he works in a puddle of water, comes home drenched clear through to the bone. And then coal seams, they might be three or, or four feet high. Man's got to walk all hunkered over so you don't hit his head up on the roof. But some of them coal seams are 18 inches. Man's got to crawl on his belly all day long. Now what kind of job is that for a big man like my Jimmy? He don't get a lunch hour because every minute that he's not loading coal, he's not making money. Coal monitor might work eight or ten hours before he loads coal. He don't get paid for that time. On a good day, he might load 16, on a good day, let me just say, if he wants to go in before the man trip, he might walk two, maybe three miles. Once he gets to the face, he's got to dig out the undercut, drill the hole for the black powder. Oh, he's got to buy all of his own powder and equipment that he, from the company store, and he pays four times what he'd pay for it at Beckley or Charleston. And no matter what, if a fellow gets close to paying off his debt, they just raise prices, making sure you always owe money. And therefore, you can't never leave the coal camp. After he's drilled the hole, he yells, he sets the shot, yells, fire in the hole. While he's waiting for the shot to go off or the smoke to clear, he can grab himself a sandwich or a fried pie, something you don't need to bother with a knife or a fork. And then once the smoke clears away, then he's got to haul rock. And then, and only then, does he load coal. On a good day, he might load 16 ton. Of course, he has to load a ton and a quarter to equal one ton because the company says men put too much rock into the coal. And so they have to load a ton and a quarter as if loading rock is not company business. On a day my husband has been paid for loading 16 tons of coal, he has loaded 20 tons of coal. And these fellers, they got them a brotherhood underground. Oh, y'all, everybody has a buddy. You never go underground without your buddy. 
Jimmy's buddy's one of them black men up from Alabama. Jimmy's been telling me that here in 1931, in some parts of America, black folk don't always get paid the same as white folk, but in a West Virginia coal mine, it's equal pay for equal work. UMW of A makes certain of that. And every, every feller has a nickname. Jimmy's nickname is Muscles. You see how he got that? He's so strong. His buddy's nickname is 18 months. You see, 18 months, he lost half an ear down in a coal mine accident down in Alabama, so he only has an ear and a half for 18 months. And I thought they were law professors. I thought they'd be a little quicker on that one. I'm, I'm kindly worried for you. Oh, you're not mad. All right, law, law, that's right, okay. I told him it was the sickest thing I ever heard in my life. How could they make a joke over something so important? He said, Hallie, you got to have a sense of humor if you're going to face going underground every day. I expect it's true. So much can go wrong underground. There's rock falls that can crush a man to death or leave him with nowhere to breathe. There's methane gas leaks and black damp and all kinds of noxious gases that can suffocate you. When I was a little girl, I used to notice the worried look upon my, fa my mama's face and how relieved she would be when that coal mine whistle blew at the end of the minor shift. Because if that whistle blows at any other time, of the day or the night. It means there is trouble underground. And the whistle keeps blowing. And it keeps blowing till it sends shivers down your spine because you know somebody could be dying. And all of us women, we run the tipple. And we wait. Women get really good at waiting in a coal camp. We wait to see who's going to come walking out of that portal and who has to be carried. When the stretcher comes up from underground, my heart rises into my throat like a lump. And I see it is not Jimmy. And I am so very happy. And then I feel so guilty for my joy because the woman standing next to me holding my hand, that's her daddy or her husband. And right behind that stretcher comes another one because every boy works alongside his father. And when a woman loses her husband, she also loses her oldest son. The ambulance drives up then. And then vehicles have windows in the side with shades that pull down and go up. And the men driving them ambulances have a way of sending us a message. If that shade is pulled down full, we know there's no hope for that man. But the shade is up. Maybe. Maybe he'll live. When I was a little girl, I used to think that my daddy saved a treat for me in his lunch bucket. Now I know these coal miners just save back part of their lunch in case they're trapped underground and they have to live off of their lunch bucket for a few days. So, I wouldn't know all this if Jimmy didn't tell me. I know they're getting all sorts of safety techniques. They wear steel-toed shoes. They're talking. They might get hard hat helmets this year. And the roof bowls that hold the roof up. And the rats. A rat warns a coal miner of danger. But rats getting out of a coal mine right quick. Coal miner knows to get out right quick, too. Coal miner won't work in a coal mine. Got no rats in it. Still, I believe a coal miner to be the bravest man alive to face those dangers as he does every day. Like I said, women, we, we don't know this because we ain't allowed underground. 
They tell me it's bad luck for a woman to go underground. I don't know about luck, but I know one thing. A woman has a hard job too, and that's waiting. Waiting and hoping and praying. Good Lord knows I spend all my time praying. <clears throat> Say, have you seen him walking? It was early this morning. He passed by your houses on his way to the cold. It's tall. He was slender. His dark eyes were tender. His occupation was mining West Virginia, his home. It was just before 12 I was feeding the children. And then they came running for to bring us the news. Number eight is all flooded. Many men are in danger. We don't know their numbers, but we fear they're all doomed. So I picked up the baby and I left all the others for to comfort each other and to pray for their own. There's John David, who's 14, and Tim not much younger. Soon their own time will be coming to go down the black hole. Oh, if I had the money to do more than just feed them, I'd give them good learn and best could be found so that when they grew up, they'd be checkers and weighers and not spend their lives a-drilling in the dark underground. It's what will I say to all of my children and what will I tell his dear mother at home? And what will I tell my poor heart that's clear breaking? To my heart that's clear breaking since my darling is gone. Say, have you seen him walking? It was early this morning. He passed all your houses on his way to the cold. He was tall, and he was slender, and his dark eyes were so tender. His occupation was mining, west of Virginia, his home. In the mines, in the mines, in the blue diamond mines, where I've worked my whole life away. In the mines, in the mines, in the blue diamond mines, where I fall on my knees and I pray. Your old black gold, you're taking my lungs. And your dust has darkened my soul And now that I'm old You've turned your back Where else is an old miner to go? In the mines, in the mines In the blue diamond mines I worked my whole life away in the mines, in the mines, in the blue diamond mines, I fall on my knees and pray. Once more. After Jimmy died, didn't know how I'd feed my family. I had seven children by then, seven mouths to feed. Old folks at Cape Ford were right nice to me. 
They let me take in a job of work now and again so I could keep the rent paid up on the coal camp house. Let the young'uns do chores in exchange for food for the table, but, but hit one enough to make ends meet. Besides, company man, come see me one day. Oh, he didn't like saying what he had to say. Miss Canty says, you know that policy only letting coal miners and their families live in these here coal camp houses. Well, fact is, he said, company lost a good man when your Jimmy died in that cave-in. But policy's policy, Miss Kent. You don't have a coal miner in your family no more, and we let you stay on six months like we let our widders stay on, but now you got to move. I think he saw the look of dismay upon my face, for he said, I got a solution. You got a boy named John David, don't you, 14-year-old? Oh, I, he can go to work for us, but not underground. He can work at the sorting table, picking through the coal. Davis's boy has been there since he was nine years old. How about it, Miss Kent? Let your boy come to work for us, and you can keep your family together in this here coal camp house. I think the thing I am most ashamed of of myself is that I considered this man's offer when I had another way to go. Oh, I thought about it for a while. What kind of job would be for my boy, John David, to go to work for the company at the age of 14? Not that working hard don't make you strong, mind you. I worked plenty hard in my lifetime, and so did my Jimmy. And then he's a good man. Went to work for the company at 9 or 10 or 11 years old and stayed there all his life till he took ill with the miner's lung or got so crippled up he couldn't work no more at all. It ain't the life I was looking for for my boy, though. And I did have an alternative way to go. Jimmy's folks had left K. Ford. Moved back to the old Kent family home place over on Paint Creek Holler in Fayette County. And every time I seen them, they kept saying, Hallie, now you bring them youngins and you stay with us. Well, I didn't want to take charity from nobody. Not even Jimmy's folks, if I could help it. But I didn't want to have to go on relief like some of them folk had to do. And I wouldn't pass my youngins out to folks that would take them like, like passing out oranges at Christmas time, neither. And I wouldn't let my boy John David go to work for the company at the age of 14 if I had an alternative way to go. So we packed our bags and we moved to Fayette County, Paint Creek, lands. Leaving K Ford that day was the hardest thing I ever done in my life besides bury my husband. I'd only ever been outside of K Ford half a dozen times, my, same as my youngins. No reason to leave. Everything we needed was right there. Movie theaters and doctor's offices and company store. No reason to leave until now. Well, I'm still here in the old Kent family home place. Jimmy's parents, of course, long since dead and buried that out on the hill where we got Jimmy's body. Young and Zeon's all grown and on their own. Got a whole passel of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, too. Come see me often enough, they do. John David lives right down the road from me a piece and has a general store. Tries to give the company store a run for its money by buying scrip at discount prices. And do you know what that boy does every single week? Every single Sunday, he brings me my very own can of salmon. And I eat the whole thing by myself, don't share it with the grandkids. <laughs> Except for Abby, she's pretty cute. All they want is pizza and burgers. Don't appreciate good food these days. But now... I, I know he wasn't meant to be a coal miner, but Elizabeth Ann's raising her family on coal miners' wages, and her youngest girl, Leah, she's a coal miner over in Boone County. Granny, she says, there's all kinds of women working underground these days. I, said, I tell her child times have changed, and that's a fact. My youngest boy, Eric, he was a coal miner before he got laid off. Now, he works construction down in North Carolina, drives home every weekend to live with his family. They don't want no part of not living in West Virginia. And uh, Timmy, well, Timmy was a coal miner before he got called. Never did come back from Normandy. Buried in some French grave, they tell me. I, I wished I had him here for Veterans Day. Now, Callie Lou and Ruthie, they both married local boys. And Callie Lou, she built herself a house right next door to me. She says, Mama, this way I can check up on you every single day. Twixt you and me, I'm the one checking on her, but don't tell, it'll just hurt her feelings. Ruthie, she and her husband Joe, they moved up to Cleveland, Ohio, working for some automobile factory up there, I believe. 
But she just came home just last week. Mama, she said, taint no place like West Virginia in the autumn when the hills are ablaze with red and green and, or- and gold. My, we had a beauty this year, didn't we? It was really something to see, folks, in Buford. I don't like to say I- I'm prouder of one of my young'uns over another, but Buford, well, he done put himself through college, and now he's a high school teacher down Charleston. Lands the day that boy brung me a piece of paper saying he could be a teacher. Well, I about burst my buttons. I was so dad blame proud of him. Something I wanted for myself, my young'un went and done for me. All my young'uns had done right well. Some of them coal miners, some not. But them coal camps, they're gone today and swallowed up by the cities and towns and, and coal mining. That's changed a whole passel from when I was a girl. Like it's not, it's going to change a whole lot more if we know what it's all about. Coal camps ain't nothing but an empty foundation amongst the trees or swallowed up by cities and towns. Of the hundreds of houses that stood in places like Cave Ford, Winona, Winding Gulf, Caperton, they are gone today. Oh, now don't get me wrong, I believe it's for the best. Today we can own our own houses. We can paint them whatever color we have a mind to. You're driving through West Virginia, you see some bright red or yellow house. It's just some old coal camp family trying to express their individuality. National Park Ranger told me that. But there's something that's missing. That sense of community that we share. I still feel it. I feel it in every nook and cranny in West Virginia, in every hill and holler. Fact is, I feel it right here in this room. For folk like you, come from all over the country to talk about your business together, have a little fellowship, make some friends, make some business acquaintances. That's community. And it is community that keeps us strong. Now, I'm here to tell you coal mining has changed a whole parcel from when I was a girl, but in many ways, it has changed not much at all. Four years ago, on the Monday after Easter, 2010, 29 men lost their lives in a coal mine called the Upper Big Branch, UBB. About three hours from here. And all, but not far from where I live. And all through Raleigh and Fayette County, there were signs saying, pray for the 29. Lift up the UBB. Pray for the families of the UBB. And I do, I pray for them every day. But let me ask you this question. Who is praying for the 14,000 coal miners that went back to work on Tuesday morning? How do you kiss your wife goodbye and go to work knowing that you are working in one of the most dangerous jobs in America? How do you let that feller walk out the door knowing that the reason his job is dangerous is because it is cheaper for a coal company to pay a fine than to fix a safety violation. Why do they do it? Why do they put themselves in harm's way every single day? They do it because they need a job. And we still need coal. It might only be half of our power electricity, but it's still at 50% today. 50% of the power and electricity in this country is still powered by coal. So until we can figure it out to use wind and and water and and sun, we got to rely on coal for a few more years, my friend. So next time you flip on a light bulb, or you charge up your fancy cellular phone, or you go to run your dishwasher, I want you to stop and think about how it is Them creature comforts are there in your house. They are there because men and women alike are working every day so you can have that power and that electricity and that warmth. And the next time you flick that light bulb, you say thank you. And then whisper up a prayer for their safety. Well, now for this jawing at you, I got to go put some flowers in Jimmy's grave. Before I go, I want to thank you all for spending this hour with me. It's been a true pleasure. Thank my friend Vince Farsetta. It's been a pleasure having him with me and my friend Ann and 
and Kenny and Sarah having you here too, even though they've seen it 8,000 and 12 times, they probably could say it right along with me, I believe. <laughs> but before I go, I'm going to sing you a little song. This song is for you, and it is for anyone who has ever mined coal or loved a coal mine. I don't want to say goodbye to you to think that we may not ever meet again. Remember me someday when you're lonely and know that you have got a West Virginia friend. I know you're only passing through. I knew it from the start. But sometimes there is love to share inside this country heart. But the rain upon the old barn roof and the coal camp song will be a pleasant company for me when you're gone. I don't want to say goodbye to you to think that we may not ever meet again. Remember me someday when you're lonely and know that you have got a West Virginia friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't have any place to go.